Hi, uh, welcome to Two Facet Podcast, the podcast where we talk about building digital products. I'm Matt Mikulski, a co-host, and I'm here with... Uh, Hongkan, I'm the other co-host. I'm a product designer. And, and I'm a product manager. Um, so, uh, today we gathered to talk a bit about something called continuous discovery habits. Yes. Um, what is it? Maybe, what is let, it, maybe right? let's start with some introduction <laughs> about what's, what was the continuous discovery habits. So continuous discovery habits is it's basically a book from Teresa Torres yeah. and she talks about how to do discovery. So maybe it's good to just give a big introduction of what is discovery, yeah. right? At least in product. Yeah. What do we do when we say discovery? Product discovery, yeah. Yeah. Um, basically it's the phase where we decide what we're going to build in the sense that are we building something that is valuable for the user? And for the business, no? Yeah. So it's this kind of moment. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there are different approaches to discovery or where it should happen, etc. Um, but similar to what this book proposes, uh, I always believed in this you should be always discovering, no? Yes. So yes. it's never uh, one moment in time. So it's not that before the project we should do the discovery to understand what do we want to build. Yeah, you should do it before and during and then after but then also. After, so it's like all the time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because and there's not only like a one truth, not like I found the solution. Exactly. It's exactly. like continuous improvement. And exactly. Yeah. And, and this, is, this is why you're constantly in discovery. And even while building, you will start refining stuff. No? And you will discover mm -hmm. things of like, oh, this we cannot build. Or, hey, why this should be built this way? Maybe let's talk to the customer to understand it. No? So... There is no certain moment for discovery. Um, yes. And maybe traditionally this discovery phase, maybe it was a bit outsourced. So yeah. you would have an outsourced research uh, resources, or maybe it was done by ex stakeholders outside of the team, yeah. um, which no, is OK. You, but you see a lot of times this top bottom, no? So it's yes. just, hey, as a board management, whomever, this is your missions, maybe not missions, but those are the things you need to build because we believe those are the next steps for the yes. company domain or whatever you're going to call it. Like the projects, right? Like We're going to do these projects on the next queue or in the next rest of the yeah. year. And it's okay, but it's true that it doesn't empower the team to maybe find a better solution, right? Yeah. Or to, yeah. Yeah, in general, in those cases, from my personal experience, a lot of times you're going to be having a situation in which you're given with a vision, so yes. what do you want to see on the other end, a full strategy how to arrive there, and probably like a short list of things you need to do to arrive there. And the project. Exactly. The so, so it's like not really very creative for a team <laughs> or um, gives them a space to do it. And there is this old quote from uh, General Patton mm -hmm. that is used a lot in the internet and I may be uh, rephrasing it a bit but but the clue is like when you give people a goal and you don't tell them how to get there you will be amazed about the journey you're gonna make um, and, and I do believe it is true to product development and product like especially in digital products where majority of the problems we try to solve are unknown no, we, yes, we, we yes. simply don't know. Um, a lot of times we are not the customer, even though we should be dog fooding and using our own products. <laughs> you know, not everybody in HubSpot is a marketer. No? Yes, exactly. So it's not that it's gonna everything gonna be clear for you and every problem gonna be clear. So and as people, we are complex. So even if you feel like you understand the people, then when using the product, it's exactly. a different thing. So if you have empowered product teams that do care much more about the discovery and they are the ones that are shaping the road to get to the goal, the results usually are much better, no? because they are able to get deeply into the domain, being domain experts and understand deeper the needs of a given slice of a customer product or whatever you have. No? Yes, and they will have the flexibility as well if, if, if they find, because technology as well, it's difficult to plan sometimes, yeah. right? So while building it, you might encounter obstacles or maybe you want to do other solutions, so you have the flexibility to Yeah, yeah so, so, so the team going back to the army um, uh, idea, uh, you know, you have a clear mission of mm -hmm. achieving a goal, KPI, whatever, and then what's going to happen in the field you are trained commandos, no? <laughs> you are there to make a goal happen. We will not like try to plan for you how the, the operation is going to look like. So 
um, the same should, should apply to the product teams. Yes. And all of this uh, was a bit gathered um, in a book called The Continue Discovery, Discovery Habits, Habits by yes. the, a, a person called Teresa Torres. Mm -hmm. uh, we really encourage to read the book. Yes. Right? Yes. It's super interesting. I, I love the book. And, and there you have a collection of tools and a collection of activities you can do to apply this, right? Yeah. So if I want to do this, where do I start? And the book gives a lot of ideas and guidance. Uh, and then we started applying a lot of the things, yeah. right? Yeah. Just before we got to oh, what okay. we applied, um, yes. I would just, as a review of a book, I would add also a ton of real life examples. So it's yes. not one of the books where you read a lot of theory and then you need to, either you have an example from online store or no example. <laughs> uh, this one has like real examples, a bit more complicated ones that what you would find in the normal online tutorials. Um, and we today will not go through the book itself. Like we will not go through all of the chapters trying to explain what's in the book. Uh, we will not be better than Teresa in, in explaining it. Instead, today we'll just guide you through how we implemented it or parts that we implement in our daily practice. Yes, yeah. because um, and it's also said in the book that you don't necessarily have to apply it exactly yeah. as it is and it doesn't mean that every single team needs to do it exactly the same yeah. way. So you can take the tools and you can take the principles and then adjust it to your own team and to your own project. And this is kind of what we, what we did. Exactly. Yeah, we'll talk about it a bit later also, but the habits are there for a reason, no? So this book is a collection of techniques, hab things that if you like incorporate into your daily practice, they're gonna um, maximize your chances of a success, mm -hmm, no? mm -hmm. or move you more towards this continuous discovery world in which you know the customers are actually helping in at the beginning of the product work, um, but as the same in development and after development, the chain of the feedback is just closed and it's continuous, so you don't wait months or like you you have direct contact to the feedbacks. So, um, our practice. Our practice. So, okay, where do we start? Um, in our team, we have something that we call the labs, yep. or like as a concept. And that for us is like our laboratory, no? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, it's basically laboratory. That's why the, 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 this is the name. So, we have one channel in which there are more stable things that we know we can or want to build. And then there is another part that is more about research and development, so it's more widely looking at possibilities, no? And yeah, so who's there uh, in this labs channel? So everybody. Everybody's <laughs> invited, it's open to everybody, yeah. but we have some roles who are more like core to yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. And actually, these are the roles that in the book they're mentioned as the product trios, yeah. right? So uh, it's like product manager, product designer, and developer that will be the product trios yeah. but in our case it's slightly like different because we have researcher yeah we, we have the the researcher role um so the, the point about the product trio just to give some explanation is um so if you will have something more close to like heap of your utilization so okay. highest paid person opinion or you have like top top bottom so you have like a product manager let's say setting the strategy saying mm -hmm. like those are the features we're gonna build those are the tasks let's go with it this is our quarter um you have one point of view yes so you exactly. have a product manager point of view this person may be amazing at synchronization and checking feasibility with other parts of a product um but it's still one point of view yeah um if we would add to this discussion a designer um the a lot of assumptions product manager makes, they're gonna be less assumptions because you have product designers, so in terms of solution, less assumptions, or assumptions are on the specialized role, uh, plus you have another point of view, no? So a bit more user-centric should be than business and strategy-centric where it comes mm -hmm. to the product manager. Um, and then in a book, uh, the trio consists of also of engineering, engineer, yes. Yes. That gives you feasibility test built in. And like, hey, this is impossible to build right now. Let's do something else. Exactly. This is important. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and the idea is that if you have those three people, only those three people meeting every week, it's impossible for them not to see all of the three, no? The three views. All so of the perspective, exactly. right? You have everything, all the knowledge you need 
to build a product. Exactly, and you have like a weekly meeting in which you talk about what do you want to build. So you can exactly. look at, we will get into it in a second, but you look at the list of potential things you want to build and you discuss of, hey, can we build it? No, because we lack research and we don't have like a business reason for it. Or yes, we would love to build it, but technically, I don't know, let's spend a week trying to build POC and see if this can fly. Or the user love it, but it doesn't have an impact on our yeah. current outcome as a team. So this kind of conversations. Exactly, yeah. and if you have those conversations weekly, it's, it, I mean, it, it's, it's really hard for those three. If they don't like each other, yes, this will not fly. <laughs> But if, if they can collaborate, it's really hard for them to not have educated discussions about their product and making those decisions much better than if it would be just one product manager, strategist, or whomever is the person that makes the top, uh, top down uh, decisions about the strategy and the, the approach. Yeah. So, so this is the idea about the product trio. Um, but I am a fan of this idea of merrier the better, no? Mm -hmm. the happier. Um, so in our case, we also have specialized roles of product analysts and product researcher, and they are in the lab too. Yes. Um, so, yes. so this is like our product five people, um, not really a trio anymore, that should be on every lab to have this all of the possible views on the meeting. And then we have the engineers that, that participate, maybe less like weekly, I would say, but they are there, they're in the channels and they can come, it's open to Exactly. To we them. do something called Umbrella Labs uh, Agenda, so mm -hmm. super good practice for any recurring meeting you have. So we post our agenda for the next meeting up front. So if any engineer wants to join, they always have open agenda, they are invited into the channel, they can join or not if the topic is interesting. Um, they do sometimes, sometimes not, so, so heavily depends on the topic and the stage of uh, where the topic is in the stage, no? So, uh, but this is the idea uh, and when it's weekly. So basically yeah. if the meeting is weekly, trying to one week talk about opportunities and then let's see what's happening next week, what we, what yes. we learned there. And then the channel it's open all the time for yeah. continuous conversation. So whenever someone has an idea, did an interview, has results from some experiment, or just read an article somewhere that is relevant to, to any of the topics, then the channel lives on its own life. Yeah, true. Exactly. <laughs> so this is the basically the space where we started to apply these these continued discovery habits yeah. that are described in the book. And one of them, one that is the very important one, is the continuous interviewing. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have this highly specialized role, which is the researcher, and in our case, this person is leading the this kind of interviewing and research process. Uh, although we all of us contribute, yeah. like the people in the labs as well, input with what we want to learn, right, or participate in the in the interviews. And also, we not only have. Oh, recently we had like uh, you know seven people signed up for one interview, no? So it would uh, be yes. funny one doctor <laughs> with like eight interviewers on a call. Yeah. This would be nice Q and A session. Yes, um, yes. So sometimes they become a bit over over popular. Uh, but you were saying that we also have different things than interviews only, no? Yes, we do interviews. We do surveys as well. We've done some co-creation sessions with yeah. uh, with users. Uh, we yeah. try to launch some experiments, so some smoke tests, um, anything that can come to your mind. Um, and the general idea from the book, again, uh, this is the continuous part about the, from the title, is like if you have this labs meeting uh, of the product trio every week, uh, you will have questions. No? So it's mm -hmm. like, oh, but let's build this. Oh, but how the user will use this or why do they need this? Yes. Million questions can come to your mind. So the idea is you ask these questions and then since every week you have enough space to run some research activities, mm -hmm. you should be able to come next week on the next meeting and bring some either results or initial results. And it's fine if it's one interview, no? It's like, okay, so yes. we are learning and okay, I did first interview, here are the initial results, I will come back in with three new, but it's continuous, no? You start seeing pattern. It's like people talk, they ask questions to themselves and then they try to answer the questions. So, so this is where the research comes in. And, and as Homskal mentioned, we, we have different techniques. So in our case, it's not always interviews. It will not be that scalable. Taking consideration uh, multiple countries, multiple languages, different customer groups, a bit more complicated setups. It's not that easy for every team to have like only interviews going. Uh, 
but the important part is to be in touch with customers continuously, continuously you know? exactly. through interviews, through surveys, through whatever works for you right now in your given context. But it's not like, oh, we will do the research right now and then let's come back to it three months from now when we will be releasing. This is a bad idea. No, it's like you always will have questions to the customer, so it's just better to schedule those interviews six months in the head ahead and just keep going to them. I promise you, you will have something to ask the customer every day. Yes, and it is true that we kind of organize them a bit into topics that would be this question. So we have this group of questions, we do a research activity, we do the conclusions, and then we have new set of questions, new research exactly. activity and new conclusions. And this is kind of the, the continuous loop. Yeah. And we also cross it out of time with data. This is very yes. useful. We have the data analysis, so this is very useful. So for we can us. bring much more behavioral data. So we can cross quantitative with qualitative data and then have much more educated discussions. Sometimes it's impossible, impossible but this is nice also. Um, so when you have, we have these discussions and the product knowledge is there, if something is impossible, this is a clear signal for us, oh, we need to make it possible in the future. No? Uh, to so track something or to exactly, know something or from data. Is, yes, is this data yes. possible? How we treat data sets will... The, or a lot of times when we are shaping the experiment, it's like, okay, let's do this because we have this question. But then it can turn out, having product analysis, he will say like, yeah, but these things will not answer this question. They will tell yes, you people do this and yes. this, but totally not answering your question. No? Or maybe we already have the answer in this set of data. We can have exactly. a look and extract and have it from there. Mark, et cetera. So, so it's, it's, it's much different having those people. And, and yeah, that's true also in our, uh, our, in our continuous part. One thing is research, but a lot of times we also have like points to the data saying like, yes. okay, so for this hypothesis, let's pull some data from here and there to see if we see these behaviors also in a scale in, in different places. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And also, so what do we do with all these insights that we gather continuously? Mm -hmm. We would have more like one or two boards. Yeah that are continuously growing and continuously evolving, adding more like information and then you have the flows of the user and every result from the interviews are added there. You, you can imagine it as, without getting into too much details, you can imagine since we're working with doctors, we have some board for doctors where we have all <laughs> majority of the insights and we have worked with patients, so we have some patient prototypes and some behavior data and boards and insights that the research team is just constantly growing as a global initiative of like a knowledge uh, map library or however you're gonna call it we have about our customers and then from those huge ones we bring whatever is relevant to the team right now right yes what, for the outcome of the team whatever is more yeah. interesting for the outcome yeah. we bring into the opportunity tree which exactly. is one of the tools uh, from the book yeah so you can imagine you go into the interview and normally you're gonna see like I noted down three things much more usually, but I have like three main insights and you will see like, oh, those are just general things about doctor life, whatever, I should share it to the company, this is knowledge that shouldn't mm -hmm, be shared. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have this third one that is super specific to the topic we were talking about last week. So yes, this is the nugget, I needed this one, you bring it to the next labs meeting and say like, hey, hello, I have the insight, this is true or not true, or whatever is the result. And then you usually put it into the opportunity solution tree. Into the opportunity solution tree. Which is another concept from the book that we borrowed. Um, so do you want to explain? No, basically I can say what are opportunities. Yeah. So basically the opportunities are these insights that can be a user problem, they can be a desire, or they can be a need that yeah. is not unmet. So it can be more or less anything that we could impact. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, so there are not ideas or features or problems, a lot of people say, eh, no, those are user problems. Can we start writing stories and solve user problems? Not everything you can build a product on top is a problem, no? I mean, bad example, I mean, I like the example, but nobody likes it. It's like Gucci does not solve an issue. <laughs> yes. It's a desired product. It's a desired, It yes. does have its own space in economy and life, and you may like it and you may never buy it or whatever. But it's a product with product market fit, super valid revenue for years, does not seem to be disappearing, and it's a desired product. It's not solving any of the issues. Mm -hmm. like, you could phrase it into the problem. Oh, yes. I want to fit into high society, blah, blah, blah. You can call it a problem, but no, it's like a desire. So, and, and thinking only problems, you can miss some opportunities. So what Teresa yes. Torres proposes is, 
let's wrap everything into opportunity. Sometimes a problem, sometimes a desire can be, or something that is an aspiration, no? Yes, so. yeah, or just a need, something that you normally do on a daily basis, you don't have a problem with it, but it's a need that maybe if we attack it, we can... Exactly. We can yeah, 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 yeah. This can be aspiration. A yeah. lot of stuff can be under the opportunity umbrella. So instead of thinking only problems, we think opportunities. Um, all of those opportunities, so those are the branches of a tree, mm -hmm. but a tree needs a root and a trunk no? to yes. grow branches on. The tree starts from one outcome we want to see. So there should be like a clear outcome on the other end that we want to see. This gives the team like a compass whenever we see those insights so this is this yes. moment when you come back from the interview you see like oh this guy told this person told me about this fix and it's like okay but how do they relate to the outcome i want to achieve okay this helps in different things this is aspiration that helps here um but this one oh okay if we drive on this one maybe this outcome gonna be there maybe more patients gonna book visits just so the <laughs> lack of the better example right now uh, but this is, it, it is highly important to have this one clear outcome at the beginning of the tree and then you keep adding next branches to the tree, no? Yes, With yes. With like continuous discovery, basically. And one thing that can be useful after the outcome is like, okay, where, where do I start? To start placing the opportunities, maybe it's useful to use maybe the order of a flow, like yeah. a super high level flow, like the journey of the user. Yeah. Maybe that helps to start placing the opportunities. So at the beginning, the user needs this, then in the middle has this problem, yeah. and at the end there's this aspiration. And then from there, you can start yeah. like, maybe we can have a graph in the video. No? We, we can, visual. we can yeah. visualize <laughs> our version of the tree. Um, and then after opportunities, in a book you would have solutions or experiments you want to validate this opportunity with. So we need to keep in mind, we are living in agile world, everything's unknown, everything's just an idea and hypothesis. So uh, we should treat those opportunities in a tree as hypothesis. So mm -hmm. I heard it in the interviews, this opportunity exists, how can we scale it? Yes. And I believe Teresa will not tell you, build the features, launch it and check. <laughs> she, she, she would hopefully say more, okay, so now solutions. So what can be the first experiment we can build to see if this opportunity is three and uh, true and actually this drives this outcome, no? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and how do we go for solutions actually? So part? normally, so you would have the tree of opportunities and may, maybe you have like a bigger opportunity that has more details inside, yeah. right? So from this opportunity, we have more details inside. So you would choose one, two or three or whatever. And then what we do for ideation, most of the time we do asynchronous ideation. So between these weeks, all of us, we think, and then we bring these ideas to the, to the labs, to the meeting, and we discuss them together. Yeah. Every now and then we do as well like ideation sessions or uh, more like yeah, yeah. ideation activities. Um, and we try to map those results into this tree so we understand what are possible solutions for the opportunities. Uh, sometimes when we go into any of the solutions, mm -hmm. uh, we, you, we sometimes create a separate opportunity tree actually. Yes, yes. Because then you get too much into the detail, yeah. right? Like, okay, this opportunity has this set of 10 touch points we could attack. Yeah. So imagine, and then for each touch point, I can think about multiple possibilities. So then we move this to another separate tree we can, where we can keep uh, working yeah. and talk about data, the specific details and the specific details of the solution and the opportunity. Uh, and, and it's yeah. more like... Uh, iterations, opportunity yes. tree more, no? And so it's more tactical, no? So the other one would be more strategical or the direction yeah. of the team and this one, yeah. It's, it's more tactical. The idea for them, in my mind, behind was you have this one that lives a lot, uh -huh. a, a long time, no? So you have a big tree and you, you will have opportunities. Uh, and usually you would go for one experiment, you close it, it's fine. Um, from our practice, a lot of times you have a product that you launch, you need to work on it for a while to get yes. to some level of scale solution and then you can live it, no? So, yes. so that's why I believe like this iteration tree is, is also useful for us exactly. in typing. We can always delete it and say like from the board, the main one, we deleted a branch that 
born does not exist anymore. We forget about this project and opportunity. But as long as we are working on opportunity, we can get a bit deeper, as you, as you said. So. Exactly, especially because a lot of times we start with a super MVP, and then of course we plan to do various yeah. iterations, and then in these iterations we're finding smaller and smaller opportunities. Yeah, but and what's yeah. important there uh, for all of the product managers out there is this iteration three, keep it bounded to some outcome too. Because at some moment, mm -hmm. as usually with iterations, you can get infinite number of them. So it's good to keep yourself at bay, saying like, okay, but are we still like contributing to this goal? Or we are just yes. micromanaging of like, yeah, one plus percent added because of this <laughs> two weeks work, we are so amazing of our niche market. You should stop at some moment. No, and this outcome at the top gives you this sanity check again on the lab. So yes. you can have discussion about, hey, we find this 25 nice details here and say, like, yeah, but will that move the needle? No, okay. Shall we keep continue discovering here? No, okay, let's move to another opportunity because it's also important to keep the, the tree clean. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm a big time gardener. I have some trees in my home. You need to trim trees. If you don't trim trees, it's bad things for them. I mean, they will look like this. They're not really pretty. They're not producing fruits. You need to trim trees. The same is with opportunity trees. If you finish with opportunity, no problem. If you invalidated opportunity, actually close it. No, now with our practice, we have more and more discussions about we had an opportunity and then, ah, let's not do it. And then, oh, let's not do it. This is too small. This is stupid. But let's it's not... about it. It's about exactly. it seeing the things that you don't have to do. Right? Exactly. Yeah, it's the risky. No? It's like, exactly. Imagine we would spend time building all of this stuff that we invalidated in the labs. It was like, whoa, we would spend 10 times more time building shit that nobody would care ever about. No? So this is the value that, that, that truly comes from, from it. It's like you can discard a lot of stuff and do things only yeah. that may matter. Uh, you still may fail, but and to help us with this, a lot of times we not only have the bigger outcome, but we have a smaller success outcomes for yeah. each of the opportunities. Like, okay, to consider this opportunity like a valid one, yeah. we would we would need to reach this exactly. intermediate goal. Yeah, outcome. yeah, to see some behavior, some KPI moving towards yes, this was the good idea. It's like a proxy metric to the main outcome, mm -hmm. no? So sometimes you see. Um, We've been talking about it in triple diamond, but <laughs> life is not linear, no? So it's not one decision and then, mm -hmm. oh, if I add this, everything's going to be great. Usually it's a mix of one million small value variables. So sometimes you will have a few smaller opportunities that combine going to bring it, but then you need to use some proxies behind them. This also helps us prioritize opportunities sometimes. So it's yes. like, okay, so we have this big one with super clear value and it's like, uh, directly connected to outcome or we have those three small ones with five proxy metrics it's like that's gonna be easier now let's work on this one first and those maybe we will god knows what to do with them later um yeah yes okay yeah sorry no no <laughs> Not I, podcast no, only, no. I was going to move already to the, to the next topic so because it's move. super connected, yeah. right? I mean, next topic. So what happens then for these solutions? When do we build these solutions? Because we do a smaller experiment, but we need to reach to a moment when we actually develop a feature, right? Yes. Like, yes, we're ready to launch this feature. And then for that, what we do is that we combine it with ShapeUp. So the yeah. moment we feel like we're ready for a solution, like an actual feature that delivers value, we move to the to the shape up uh, process. Yeah, to the shaping session. Actually, sometimes we do it even earlier. So it's a, I, I saw it a few times. It's like once we are super hyped about opportunity, we have or we don't have evidence. It's just not <laughs> a nice opportunity. It's like we saw a seed and it's like oh we like it. We a lot of times jump into shaping session, and this is very nice example for me of why this should be continuous because we jump into shaping session and then ten minutes into the session we are like oh. We don't know what's the problem here. Yes, it's oh, an this exercise. guy wants to build this, and that person builds <laughs> that, and then this guy understood it as just send an email to someone, and then it's like ah, so we cannot shape it right now. We need answers. So what are the questions? Oh, would it be enough to send an email? Um, can we build instead that one? And so this opens this conversation now, and then next week you we can talk about it, and maybe we will find out that all three ideas were stupid. Let's just not even shape <laughs> this opportunity, or we will find out oh, this one may actually work. And then it's, oh, this is our problem definition. No, this is what we want to build. Exactly. So the fact that you decide to start the shaping of an idea doesn't mean that you have to build it. But here it's more like an exercise of, are we able to solve 
to, to solve it somehow yeah. with our current knowledge and with our current tools and this will tell you if you should like pursue with, with it or not yeah, so exactly. yeah another the risking activity right but closer to the but that's, to that's the, the idea of the shape up is to set up the boundaries and then mm -hmm. if you cannot understand the boundaries it's like yeah you, you cannot shape it further you cannot go with it um, I guess it would be similar when you would try to do user stories and things yeah. like this yeah maybe in case of user stories you could fly to yourselves a bit more um but i don't know i don't know i mean in shape up you also can imagine stuff and say like no this is true yes of course Sup super true like you can those move. use cases already exist and like, <laughs> proven yeah you can lie always so that's that's true yeah and then another thing we do from shape up let's say is that we keep this building track and that's the moment when okay so after shaping and after doing the pitch and everything we do the building track and the track that it's in parallel with the discover is this uh, this other one we talk with the yeah. labs and the continuous discovery so we are having like the two frameworks in parallel exactly combined. and this is the difference between so in shape we also have the two cycles uh, two two cycles it, basically yes, so yes. you have the strategy cycle that is shaping cycle and then you have a development cycle uh, we instead of doing the shaping cycle by the Batescom ideas, we do it through this continuous discovery habits, and this is our labs. The difference is also it never ends. So since it's continuous, it keeps producing pitches, opportunities, ideas, experiments, and then whenever we are at the we need to do the betting table, we should have a list of pitches already. Like you know, it's baby steps, so some teams gonna have it ready by the betting table. Some will have exactly of the hour <laughs> of the betting table we're getting better sometimes too much opportunities is also not good so you need to trim your trees uh, but yeah it, it's continuous one and what's really amazing is a lot of times during the batch we can use the discovery track so if any of the problems happens for the batch team the batch team can reach out to the labs and we can within the one week provide them some information so the discovery can you know um, contribute directly to the development that's yes, happening right yes. now and the same is from the development point of view so whenever we deliver and we start having feedbacks this is like clear no this lands it's in the labs to the, and to then the labs. we have new iterations and new opportunities either for the thing that we just shipped or new stuff that just resurfaced because of something we unlocked or yeah, yeah. so so it's it's a cycle <laughs> it doesn't have stop and then it just keeps continuing going to the circle so yeah yeah what else do we do there um yes we do have notes every time so I'm just <laughs> checking it no basically basically that's it yeah. yeah and normally in our case what we do is that in the building track we attack normally just two projects at a time no yeah. more than that because you know teams are, are small so yeah yeah but yeah, yeah totally uh what i would also add there is so our solutions that we produce in the opportunity solution trees are not solutions per se. So they are not visual solutions. True, because um, they are be even before shaping. So yeah. it's more like a direction of a solution, exactly. let's say. Yeah, and then what the team gets from us is the shape up pitch. So it's pretty general overview that includes some version of a solution, but it's not you know, it's not visual mock-up or prototype of what it should be done with full specification all of the use cases. It's more like, hey guys, we saw this opportunity, we're able to validate it, it does exist, and this is the boundaries we would like to produce some solution for this opportunity, no? And yes. we tried that solution looking this way may work, no? So let's go that direction. And this is also why during the discovery we focus a lot on discovery and we do some ideation but we don't like we don't have like super strong ideation activities as well yeah. because the ideation into detail like really how are we going to do it happens inside the, the batch team, yeah. with the team that is own owner of the of the solution. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is basically it from the things that we implemented and, yeah. and, and we are proud about. Um, there are a few conclusions we wanted to share with you, just like tips at the <laughs> end of like what to do um, if you would like to go for it so Hunka, well one of them is that maybe not every team has already implemented like a framework for discovery right in, and it may feel like super hard and super far away like oh my god where do I start to do all of this all yeah. of this research but you can always start with baby steps this is also uh, explained in, in the book and this is also what we did I remember at the beginning we started the labs just with the meeting Right? We didn't have the opportunity yeah. tree, we didn't have any framework. 
So it's like, what can I do this week? What can I implement? Which small activity can I do? And then let's see what else can I do next week, no? And then you can go bit exactly. by bit building your, your own. Because, own. you know, the habits part in a book is not there by, the, by luck or by chance. You need to build habits. And, and it's like with the gym. If you go once to the gym, it's not a habit that you're a gym guy and you go to the gym every time in your life. Even after a week, I promise it's not a habit yet. Um, there are psychologists and psychiatrists having a ton of books about building habits, but you need to power through it. I mean, continue <laughs> doing it. And then at some moment, your brain will pick it up as like, okay, this is part of my mind. No? So it's like, if you talk to the customer once, does that mean it's a habit now and you will be talking to the customers every time you need to practice. So it's a good one. Yeah. And it's important, as uh, as Funkal said, to do baby steps. So the book proposes says like the ultimate goal of you should be having those interviews weekly. Like as we said, this is the best one, no? If you can have it. But if you start having like two customers a month because you never recruited customers, that's fine. No, you're, you're going better that than direction. Zero. No, it's better, better than, than zero. zero. You're yeah. already talking to the customers. There is some discovery ha happening instead of imagination work, no? So, 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 so this is very important. Uh, what else? And then another one is that if you're more used to the other way of working in the sense of uh, having outsourced uh, discovery or having the discovery done by the stakeholders, it's not easy to do the change of mind from one day yeah. to, to another. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. This is not a revolutionary idea. So it, and also <laughs> I would not use it as a framework. So it does not come bundled with everything. Uh, you can as well use just one thing. We also doesn't use the, the whole uh, habits that were presented there. Um, and about the revolution versus evolution, even in the book it's mentioned a lot of times, it's like you may start with a company that just has a zero discovery, as you said. No, yeah, it's yeah. zero framework, nobody talks to customers, or only sales and customer access talk to them, so you don't have access. Um, it would never work if you come and say like, hey, hello, here's the silver bullet of a book, let's implement everything, it, yeah. and it's going to be great of an investment. <coughs> I mean, if you're amazing at pitching, you may pitch it to a few people and they will go for it to do the whole thing. But usually with things like this, it's better to, okay, so let's have a product team talking to customers now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's have a one month an interview with customers or, or whatever small techniques to, to start showing to the rest of the organization the value you can deliver from discovery. Um, and it's not the one that you expect, so you will not start showing, when you're good at it, you will not start showing to your board like 25 features we need to build because those are the best opportunities. You're probably going to show like, hey, this is one opportunity that we believe it's actually a good one, and then there's like 25 bad ones, if we would build them, we would spend a lot of bad time. And, and this is the value continuous discovery can bring you. You will not build things that are unrelevant or not needed, um, not useful. or less chances to build it. No? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. And the last one, the last tip, um, it is hard mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as we're building any habits. So uh, from our practice, from people I talked about this book and, and, the pro and how they implemented it, um, young product team cannot do it by themselves fully. Um, it is important to keep trying, keep learning, keep getting better. Um, but I would really recommend this if you want to go full steam, implement everything, probably to a bit more senior product teams that mm -hmm, are experienced mm -hmm. in building products and have already some discovery. Um, if you're starting or you have zero discovery, I, I would not propose you to go fully into everything unless you have some good call Santas or someone that can coach you because it's not an easy process. It does require some change in mind and some changes in our organization sometimes silly things like how to recruit customers now sometimes yes, you just don't have yes. a clue no? and even from the contributor uh, point of view you're changing your mind to I'm just building the thing yeah. right so now I am thinking about opportunities and I am thinking about how to impact the business so it's a small uh, switch of mind that requires time yeah. and some seniority sometimes yeah yeah, yeah. So, so I would say similar like shape up it's not something you read the book and the next day you apply it and you can fly with it um, a lot of practice, failure, small steps, worth trying, but you know, if your team is new and you just discovered Scrum, I would probably be not jumping into, let's implement every, every chapter of the book. Yeah. So. I think that's it. 
I think so too. Uh, yeah, I, I hope this was useful for you. Um, if the topic is interesting, let us know. Uh, we can present a bit more uh, episodes around the discovery and mm -hmm. how we how we run it. Uh, thank you for this one. Thank you. It was super nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hope you enjoyed it too, and we see each other in the next episode very soon. See you. See you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.